Welcome to the Enlighten Up Podcast, where I am going to take you into a deep exploration of what it means to exist in this current reality. We are going to raise your vibes, open your mind, expand your heart, and dive deep into the wondrous mysteries and possibilities of this lifetime. There's been a spiritual catalyst that has set in motion the awakening process of many across the globe to return to the knowingness of self and unite what has been separated. Together, we're going to bring light into that darkness. We're going to remember the joy of living. But most of all, we're going to turn up the volume of our own eternal power and do the thing we're here to do. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Enlighten Up podcast. And I couldn't be happier to do this episode with you. This has been a long time coming. I have been waiting almost two and a half years to be able to offer you this episode. I've been waiting and I'm I'm so happy that it's finally here. I can't wait to introduce you to my guest, uh, who is the executive director for Veterans for Child Rescue. His name is Forrest Seeley, and he is here today to share some great news with me and for all of you to potentially be part of a very important cause. Forrest, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you here. Nicole, thank you for having me on. It is an honor to be on your show, and I'm very appreciative of you inviting me on. Yeah, my audience is going to love this uh, episode today. We're gonna, they're going to love the topic and they're going to also love the information that we're going to share. And just so you guys know, about two and a half years ago, I was approached by a company called United to One. And it didn't take me very long at all. In fact, I was jumping at the, I was just, just jumping to get in there. Uh, they offered me an opportunity to help uh, raise money for children who are being trafficked. And of course, many of you who've been following me for years know that that is the number one cause that is near and dear to my heart is the cause that I could get behind without any shadow of a doubt. And I am so excited that United to One has brought on Veterans for Child for Rescue to help them raise money so that they can save more children from the human trafficking rings. That is a huge problem in our world, one that is completely shadowed in its, uh, I think in the enormity of what it actually is. So sit down, get comfortable. Cause we're going to go into a lot of details here. And, uh, Forrest, why don't, why don't we start with, first of all, how you got involved with veterans for child rescue? Okay. It's kind of an interesting story. The first thing that I tell people is I am not a veteran. The, the founder Craig Sawman Sawyer, he is a veteran. Um, he and I grew up together and Craig is two years older than I am. When I was, uh, I think in the third grade, we moved from the South side of Houston to the North side into another little community called Conroe, Texas. And we found a church and Craig's father was a minister of that church. And we immediately became friends. We spent a lot of time in the woods on bikes the lake. I mean, a lot of outdoor stuff. And we basically, we had a very wonderful childhood. And when we get to, um, when Craig graduated from high school, he joined the Marines. He went into the Marines and I was two years behind him. And so when I graduated from high school, I went and played college and football at University of Houston. And at that time, Craig got out of the Marines. He was uh, wanting to get into um, this new outfit called the Navy SEALs. And at the time, this would have been 1985. Nobody, they didn't know who, what that was. And so we, we had been doing some research. And it was pretty cool. So he, he takes a path off into the military. My path after college took me into banking and we always remained friends. And one day, right around uh, 2015, 16, he was having a conversation uh, with a intelligence person uh, that that conversation took place 
in his backyard here. I think he was at his parents or his friend's backyard here in Texas. And he proceeded to talk about how prevalent human trafficking of children was in Texas. And the, the, the I-45 corridor going down from Mexico all the way up through Dallas was a huge trafficking lane. And he looked at him really strange, like, what are you talking about? You know, we grew up in this wonderful utopian environment uh, where we would get up in the morning during the summer and we would be out till the sun came down every day of the week. And we spent a lot of time at church and, and youth group and all that. So we didn't have any, any problems in that regard. And so he started doing some research and he said, I need to make a documentary about this. And so in order to do the documentary, he had to start the nonprofit to raise money. It was very difficult to raise money. Nobody wanted to help him. Nobody wanted to talk about this. And, you know, after his military career, he had actually spent 10 years in Hollywood uh, on the Discovery Channel on several well, very well-known shows, Top Shot, Rhino Wars, um, Mail Call with Arlie Army. And, uh, but all of his... Hollywood connections were very encouraging for him to do a documentary, but nobody wanted to help. They said, oh yeah, it's a great idea, but nobody wanted to help. So fast forward, it took us several years to do that. At the time he asked me to be on the board of directors and I was happy to do it. And fast forward in um, 2020, end of 2020, beginning of 2021, we started looking for an executive director. Eventually, um, we'd had a consultant that we worked with, um, Charles Pearson, who was just a wonderful man. And he said, hey, Craig, um, what do you think about Forrest being your executive director? And Craig goes, well, you know, he, he doesn't have the experience. And, he, and Charles says, well, you know, he has more experience than I had when I started out. And he goes, and what's the most important thing that you need? He says, I need somebody I can trust. And he goes, well, do you trust him? He says, absolutely. So um, I jumped in with both feet. And, you know, here we are today. We've um, the first year was pretty tough. Uh, we were coming coming out of covid uh, and we were um, struggling with law enforcement, law enforcement. They they were busy. Uh, uh, they were short staffed because of a lot of things that happened during that time period. So we were trying to fire up more operations and um, we were blessed because we had built a small core team and we focused on our social media. We were pushing hard to get into law enforcement. Um, and so we came up with a different, what I call sales strategy with them. And it's, it's been very effective. And here we are today. Uh, we also got a radio show. We have a TV show that's on the Grio and a radio show called defending our children. And, uh, we're running operations and we're working on another podcast called wisdom quest. So we're doing a lot of really great things and we just keep our head down and we keep our, you know, our, our eye on the prize and we just move forward one step at a time. That's wonderful. And, and thank you so much for joining the cause and, and helping out because, you know, there's so many people that do support it, but don't know how to really get involved. And some people are scared to get involved, which many people don't understand why uh, until you start to get a little bit uh, more into the details of what's actually happening uh, in this industry. <laughs> uh, so how was it for you guys when United to One approached you about helping you guys raise money to do your operations to save more children? Well, what's interesting is I spoke to our mutual friend Vaughn uh, several years ago. And because I had a banking background and I also had a background in digital wallet development, uh, with the first conversation we had, I gave him a lot of free consulting advice and it was so funny because I had to educate him or I felt like I educated him on several things that they weren't aware of. They had a fabulous idea on, on helping to raise money. Fabulous idea. It's a wonderful idea. And so, but what's interesting about Vaughn is anybody that meets Vaughn, this guy is just, he has got the biggest heart. I know he is a wonderful conversationalist. He's very good. He's got a great, he's a good logical thinker. Um, he doesn't get his feelings hurt. You know, you can, you can poke at him pretty hard. And, and, and I do, <laughs> uh, we all do. And, and his team, they are all just wonderful folks. They care about the children. Um, they are hardworking. 
uh, this has been a long process. It's, they put a lot of work into this program. So it's been a wonderful experience with those guys. I, I, and, and, I mean, they're lifelong friends now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I know Josh and Michael with United to One are just fantastic men. And I think everyone who's part of United to One is just a stand up human being. You know, you really can't couldn't ask for better people to be running and be supporting um, this cause. That's the kind of heart that you need because this is a very delicate matter and there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of things you have to be aware of that not anyone would normally just be aware of. And so lots of hurdles and obstacles to overcome that most industries wouldn't even come close to having to address. So um, I'm excited to to be a part of, of this and to help out in any way I can. And so for anyone who may not know, uh, I definitely can relate a little bit to this, uh, this cause in the sense that when I was a child, I was sexually abused um, by a distant family member. And so it leaves a very traumatic mark on your soul and it affects every area of your life. And I can't imagine what it would be like to be taken from your family, to be separated, to be put into these kind of rings and subjected to the, the abuse that is just absolutely um, abhorrent. And so I'm asking each and every one of you to please listen through to the end because this is all important information and one of the greatest ways that we can help others is to pass on the information to share this episode. And so with child trafficking, sex trafficking going on in the world, a lot of people don't realize how big of an industry it is. How big is the actual industry for anyone who may not know? Well, the estimates are $150 billion worldwide, somewhere around 2020. Um, we were estimating it at 38 to $50 billion in the United States. Keep in mind, that is greater than all pro sports combined. So if you're like, I'm in Texas, I'm a Texans fan. Texans made the playoffs. I'm so happy. And in my office, I've got a Texans picture hanging up. I've got Texans jerseys in my closet. I've got a license plate. So there's evidence that you witness wherever you're located. It could be a college team. It could be a pro team. And yet this is bringing in more dollars under the cover of our communities. So I think that's what's important about what we're talking about today. So people are aware. Nobody wants to talk about this. OK, they don't want to talk about it. It's easy to ignore because if you look in your own little bubble, in your own little household. But I can tell you that every person, Nicole, for example, when I talk to people, number one, when I meet strange women and men that I've never spoken to before, they share some of their story like you just shared, maybe not the details, but it's it's significantly larger than you can imagine. Okay. Yes, if I were in a group, yes. Yeah. And, and it's surprising to me. I mean, I have four sisters and my mother and father raised me on how to behave. I'm not, I'm certainly not an angel, but I can tell you that there are certain ways that you should that you should treat people. And, and me in, in Veterans for Child Rescue and our team, we think that it's not just ending child trafficking, but the next phase is teaching young men to be honorable and young women to be honorable and how they treat each other, how they grow up, because the only way we're going to make society a better place is to raise a better generation of kids and leaders for the future. Yes. And, and so 150 billion, over $150 billion industry a year with 38 billion coming from the States alone. 38 to 50. And again, you know, they're not filing their taxes. These are various estimates through government agencies and, and private, you know, uh, think tanks, but we see it um, on an everyday basis. If you, if you talk to our community every day, it's almost like we're, um, you know, David and we're and not, we're not throwing stones at Goliath. We're throwing toothpicks at him. Okay. It is so easy for us to find pedophiles, find traffickers. It's not a very difficult thing to find them. It's, um, it's very simple. It's, it, it actually is crazy simple. 
So the hard part is getting the funding to execute the operations and provide the aftercare for the people you actually rescue. Indeed. There is a lot of, now, if you look at law enforcement, for example, law enforcement, they are, there are a lot of wonderful people in law enforcement. And we, you have to understand that they do what they know best, what's easy. And, and a great example is if you, if you arrest a male or a young male or a young female or male or female for prostitution, it's easy to prosecute. But what I've learned over the last few years, I have never met a man or a woman that was a prostitute that wanted to be. Mm. We assume that they these, these people, that that's what they wanted to do. Oftentimes, they were in a broken home. Oftentimes, they were sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally abused. Oftentimes, they were hungry, didn't have a place to live. And so what they're doing is they're taking the path of least resistance. You know, if you're a drug addict, you do what you got to do to to, to feed your addiction and put food on your table and put a roof over your head. And so what, what I'm finding is that a lot of these law, a lot of law enforcement uh, officers and agents that are working in this space are truly understanding that. And what that's doing, it's bringing empathy back to the community because it's real easy to sit here and, and look, if they're a bad guy, man, look, they need to be dealt with accordingly. They need to be dealt with it severely. But we interviewed um, a lady um, who recently, and she, her mother trafficked her. Her mother was, um, they were, she was a single mom. She was uh, handicapped. She couldn't hold a job. So her boyfriend, who paid all the bills, uh, whenever he felt like it, he would slip into this lady's when she was a young child and have his way with her. And when she became an adult, she reconciled that. She went through a process. She's a strong, strong advocate uh, fighting in the healthcare industry and the nursing industry training. She has a, the best training program that I've seen. But she admitted she, had, she forgave her mom because her mom did what she thought she could do. She had no options. She felt like she couldn't work if she ran her boyfriend off, that she would never be able to put food on the table for her child. And that's a hard thing for the average per person to reconcile. Yeah, sure. That, but, that's very difficult because most people are like, how could you even fathom that? Right, right. So you have to, in working in this space, and what I'm learning from some of the uh, law enforcement people that I'm meeting that are becoming legends in this space, and they are these are 24-7, seven days a week, um, you know, 365 days a year, but they are recognizing they have to have some empathy so for some of the people involved in this process. Today, they're, the struggle is going after the traffickers. It's easy to arrest. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the traditional model is you've got a pimp. Mm -hmm. Well, everything, for example, if there is a, a, a something with a title, they put it in the girl or the, or the boy's name. Okay. If they're old enough, they put it in their name. They put everything in their name. So any transaction that takes place, it's done by the person that the pimp is managing. So okay. the management manager doesn't have any fingerprints on it. And, um, uh, one thing that you're probably quite aware is that everything that in this area is it's all about dopamine. We're dopamine driven. Okay. So when you're wanting to get high, you're driven by dopamine. If I were to, you know, if the pimp was to tell this person that he loves them and gives, shows them love, and then later on beats them, they're doing this or going up and down, up and down. But then the, those, those folks are looking for that dopamine. This is a, there's a common misunderstanding for some of these boys and girls, why didn't they leave? Well, they've gotten, they don't have a license. They don't have a credit card. They don't have a way to sign for a lease. They don't have a bank account. So they continue to do what they believe is the safest thing that they do because they know, well, if I do this, I'll get my butt kicked. I'll get punched in the face and I can deal with that. And all I have to do is, you know, do this other thing. And then I can have as much drugs as I need to feed, to get rid of the pain. It's a cycle. Mm-hmm. So law enforcement, they're becoming a lot, much more empathetic and they're looking for different ways to address this. They too want this to stop. They want to, um, uh, you know, they want, it, it's a vicious cycle because around it, you've got chaos sur surrounding it and you've got death, murder, you know, all sorts of other things that come along with that, that they would like to get rid of. Tell me, because I know that there's um, a, a common 
think like thought process around law enforcement being involved that um, some people might be, might think of, and some people may not even cross their mind, but um, that, you know, there's obviously corruption everywhere. How would you say from your experience, how in a percentage wise, when it comes to law enforcement being involved and really wanting to solve this problem, be part of the solution, what is your estimate? Um, and of course, this is just from your experience. What is your estimate of the law enforcement really truly wanting to help and, and, and solve this? Well, it's a real difficult thing to answer because a lot of the law enforcement that we deal with, they are, they are you know, 100% behind this. Okay. okay. But then if you look at what you have to look at is you have to look at the markets and typically the larger cities um, in, in the states, the largest cities in the states, they don't seem to want to participate. Um, yeah. When you get into the smaller markets, they do want to participate. Um, and for the larger cities, it could very well be, um, there's this litmus test that are, or this, this, this benchmark that I apply to policymakers as it pertains. So that could be, it could be um, the leadership within a city or at a federal level, state or a federal level. And what is this, what does this mean? Well, there's a position that you would have as it pertains to human child trafficking. And while this is important, um, I truly think it's a lifeblood of evil. I really think it feeds evil because what we're witnessing is a, is a war on a good versus evil. Mm -hmm. You cannot peel the onion any other way. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that you can't say about child trafficking, having sex with a child, child rape. That is pure evil. Okay. So you're either ignoring it. You are benefiting from it. You are participating in it or you're being leveraged by it. Mm -hmm. And if you look back in your history of looking at your policymakers, wherever you're at, there's always those handful of policymakers that did something that was 180 from what they represented. And it makes no sense. It's very illogical. Me, I look at logic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Logic is, um, you know, if, if, uh, if somebody were to poke me in the eye, I'd either try to block it or I'd poke him back. It's it's a reflex. It's it's very logical to me. Um, whereas if I see somebody that does something opposite, I start questioning what's their motive. And usually if I'm going to convince you, Nicole, if I'm going to convince you to do something against uh, your moral compass, it's got to be pretty big. I'm either going to give you a carrot or I'm going to give you a stick. So I think when you look at our larger cities, when they're not participating, they're oftentimes worried about their numbers and they're trying to make their crime numbers look better than they are. Mm -hmm. Or they're one of the, either they're ignoring it, child trafficking, participating, benefiting, or being, being leveraged. leveraged. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. That's really good information to know. Thank you for sharing that. That makes total sense and very logical uh, method of kind of get it coming to that deduction. So Let's go back to the numbers um, of this over $150 billion industry, because it's important for people to really understand how massive this industry is. Like what other industries make that kind of money? The closest would be is, is going to be the drug, drug trafficking. Okay, okay. Drug trafficking. Yeah. So drug trafficking, we believe is probably a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't think that there's any other industries. For example, you could say gun running, you could say um, uh, banking fraud. We just don't think that there's any other criminal enterprises big. Okay. So, so people can understand if you've got a $150 billion gorilla, okay. Of an industry, it takes a lot of money to combat that. Indeed. And so this is why it's so important for organizations such as Veterans for Child Rescue and other ones to receive financial support continuously to combat this problem, to start to even just try to make a dent in it. Right. Um, it's, it's a, it's a big animal. It's, it's a really big animal. Like we cannot even sugarcoat that. So why does the industry, what makes the industry, aside from the obvious, uh, what makes it so lucrative? Oh, that's a really good question. 
if you look at the drug industry, that's a great kind of benchmark of criminal. You, know, you look at, you, if you're a criminal mastermind and you decide that you want to make money, fast money, selling drugs is a simple um, business model, okay? If you get into banking fraud and things like that, that gets more complicated. But selling drugs, the biggest problem that we're seeing with the, uh, in, in Texas, for example, the gangs, they were selling drugs. Well, they're migrating over to human trafficking of kids. The reason being is there's less risk. If once I get somebody on staff or on, you know, in my uh, working for me, I don't know what the really proper thing to say. Um, but if, if I have three or four boys and girls, typically what I have to have is somebody that's muscle and, and, and maybe somebody to manage the boys and girls. And now the average uh, prostitute makes 200 to four, $250,000, $400,000 a year cash. So if you got three or four girls, you're, you're making a million, over a million dollars cash. Whereas it's easier to keep them doped up and keep them working than it is to procure large portions of fentanyl, cocaine, meth. That's a big risk whenever you go to make your buy. Yeah. Okay. Because you're not buying it from um, uh, a, a, a manufacturing facility that is following government regulations where the police aren't monitoring. You, you're trying to acquire this. So what the what the what we're finding is the gangs and the people, the criminal masterminds, they're moving out of that space into this space because of the business model. It's easy money. It's easy for them to manage. Um, you know, recruiting somebody, and they don't necessarily. There's an unlimited supply of young adults that they can bring in that they can recruit. And it's very simple. You can groom, you can get somebody through your, through your device. I could start grooming you. I don't have to go. A lot of people yeah. believe that we're, you know, I see somebody at the mall and I drive by with a white van and I put a bag over the head, shove me. That's really not happening. I mean, it does, but it's very rare. And it's easier for me to communicate. You know, for example, if you and I connected, if you were underage, I would act like I was an underage girl. And I would have learned the lingo and then I would first start dividing you from your parents. Yeah, I bet your parents wouldn't let you do this. I wouldn't your parents wouldn't let you wear that. I would bet your parents wouldn't let you wear that shade of makeup or whatever, whatever would drive that wedge. And next thing you know, I'm going to create a meet. I'm going to get you to send me pictures, whatever it's going to take. I'm going to tell you I love you, that you're the best, that I would treat you. And once they get them past that certain, certain threshold and they meet, they get them to run away. Um, they get them to declare that they run away. Because here's a real interesting thing. If I declare that person to run away, then it's not kidnapping. Um, it's a, it's okay. a very clever ploy in most states. So in essence, the business, it's a simple business model. When, you're, when you have a lot of these criminal masterminds, they're not, they're not um, they didn't graduate from Harvard. <laughs> you know, I, a guy I met this week, he, he's, he said in like 20 years, he goes, I've never arrested a pimp that graduated from Harvard. So that's really important for parents to understand because it's happening from the phone, from a device, the internet. Indeed. You know, it's um, what's so important when I was a child growing up and, and, and Craig and I, if, for example, if I said something about somebody, like if I made fun of Craig's sister, he's got a wonderful sister. He punched me in the face and I would only do it once. So yeah. you know how important it is for children to learn those social skills. They understand boundaries. They have to negotiate, navigate face-to-face um, -face interaction. They can't hide behind something or somebody. This allows you to be bigger than you are. And so there's so many attacks happening with our kids. It could be on a video game. Keep in mind, if you are going to be a predator, if I were, it would be tougher for a predator to stalk somebody at a school than it is online because you mm -hmm. have anonymity. You can disguise yourself as a, as a child. Um, and then you can groom and manage the situation. So it is very important and it's unpopular. Parents don't want to invest 
into getting in their kid's business. But one of the greatest things, the greatest love you can show your child is to say no. When it's important to say no, to say no. Okay. So you put boundaries, you monitor what their content, you help learn who they're speaking to. You look for things that I can tell you this for most um, people that I've met, especially moms, for example, they have this moment where they're, they're, they've got a tickle in their stomach or the hair on the back of their neck. That is a sixth sense mm -hmm. and they should listen to it because mm -hmm. I have had too many times where I've spoken to mothers where they said, I had that feeling and I ignored it. And now we're in a situation that is very difficult to deal with. Is it reasonable to suggest for parents to actually have this conversation with their children, especially if they're in areas where there's big chat rooms, like video games, um, anywhere where there's, there's chat rooms. Cause I guess that's, would be the easiest way to get, to get, I mean, I'm sure it happens through social media as well, but, um, to actually have these conversations that there are people out there who will pose as another child or someone your age. And these are some of the things they might say to you. And like, is, or is that like taking away a child's innocence to like, where do you draw the line of being able to protect them and, and really putting your child in the best position possible to not be a victim of this without really kind of putting so much fear in them and introducing them to something that is so horrific. I think the wise approach, and for me, seeing what I'm seeing, I'm probably much more on the conservative side. If I, I, I would, I encourage young parents today: don't ever get your kids a smartphone until they're 18 years old. Um, however, some people aren't going to listen to that. So if you are, I would going say to, that most people aren't going to listen to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you have to limit their time on it. You have to uh, lock down their phone. You know, for example, don't allow them. You know. Today, if you go to the app store, the Google app, Google Play or, or iOS app store, you give them the ability to download whatever they want. You need to regulate what they can download. Um, chat rooms. I would I would say absolutely not to any of the social media platforms. Um, I would put my foot down on that because you are basically exposed to the world. Um, you have no you have no control. You could educate your kids, but. It's a difficult dynamic mm -hmm. because they do operate in gaming environments um, and they yeah, do. Wh which, which kind of platforms are they most prevalent on? If you go into our website, let me see. Uh, Roblox is one of the most common ones that comes up. Uh, any of the um, uh, online gaming platforms such like Roblox, um, Fortnite, uh, those type of games where you have a community where you're playing, where, where it would be like team play. Mm -hmm. And, but a lot of these game sites have a private room. So if you wanted to go strategize, you can go into a private room and they'll, they'll, they'll create a private room. Discord is another place, which is not a gaming site, but it's a great, uh, it's a CRM utilized in, in the gaming community and software community and, and, and other. Yeah. Areas. I mean, I utilize it for my business and my communities. And so, um, Yeah. I could see how that could be opt like optimal for someone of that nature. So going back to why this is such a lucrative industry, I think what a lot of people may not realize is that yes, children and teenagers and adults are being, well, they're being groomed and pulled into these trafficking rings, but it's not just, for the sexual acts um, that uh, are happening. There are other parts of the industry that I don't think people are aware of, like um, the organ industry. There's labor and there's, well, it's, well, here's something interesting. I'm glad that you mentioned organ, organ donations. If you go back in the last 30 years, there used to be, heart and lungs, there was a limited body parts that you could um, sell, that you could that you could harvest from a human. Today, there's a significant number of body parts that can be harvested. So now I want you to look at the fentanyl. Fentanyl, because I was having a discussion with an intelligence person that I'm really close to. And I said, why do you think that the cartel is um, 
trying to kill their customer. Because in 2021, there was a bust in um, New, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was like 76 pounds of pure fentanyl and like um, a million tabs. You, and then combined with all of the busts that happened in Texas, you could kill every American more than two times over with the amount if you were to ingest it. And so he said, well, look at, look at uh, our, um, the, the demand and the drive for harvesting organs. It's significantly higher. And you could put the human body in a state where they could die, but it's kind of this delayed death where you can get them on life support and har harvest their organs. It's significantly higher. So I often wondered that, but after having a deep conversation about this, I think we're overlooking, um, overlooking this. Because one thing, keep in mind, Nicole is uh, is uh, it's Nick Mick and and um, Nicosi and all the the organizations that are tracking this. Um, they're claiming that there's about uh, eighty five thousand kids they can't account for. Okay, in the past several years, so where did they go? Mm -hmm. What happened to them? And that, could they have been used for harvesting? We think that some, if not many. And so it's a great point to look at. I mean, if I understand, I, I want to make sure I have the number correct. I, I might be mistaken, but from what I understood, even just a couple of years ago, and it could be different now, but a child's heart on the black market goes for like 250 grand. You're probably right. I don't know the numbers on that, but you, certainly, I mean, imagine, imagine if your child or anybody's child that had the means that they especially had are close to the means and, and your child doesn't make the list or move up the list fast enough because you're fighting a clock when you have a, a, um, a you know, and some of these organs can go into adults. You have a, you have a expiration date when you are on a machine and you're willing to do whatever it takes to get those organs. And that may be outside the guidelines of the system that we have to, to identify who gets what, you know, what's the best probability. If I'm going to take a heart from a, a, a child that's been in a car wreck, I want to make sure that it's going to, sustain somebody's life. So that's what they, how they work. But there are those that think, well, I've got the money. I'm going to die. I can't take it with me. Therefore it creates that black market opportunity. Oh, it's just, it's, it's really horrific because you, you can't imagine what that child's going to go through in order to have their heart um, taken from them. Obviously they're going to die, but it's just, there's a whole nother layer that I don't think people realize um, that is, uh, added into the atrocity of this entire industry and it's happening. So how many children from the U S alone go missing each year? I don't know that number off the top of my head. I do know that there's a, there's 85,000. It's so I would imagine it's probably in the 40,000 plus range that we know of. That you know of. Yeah. Now keep in mind, here's the problem. And I was speaking with a statistician this week. I was in a, at an event. And unfortunately, some of the kids that go missing, they get, they, they are, they're runaways and they come back home. Well, they don't, they don't net out the numbers on some of this reporting. So when they're querying databases, so it's very difficult. So it's going to be on the lower end. It's likely higher than whatever we're seeing. Of course, then there's, there are those that don't get reported. Yeah. Okay. And then you have all these kids coming across the border Mm -hmm. uh, that aren't that aren't being tracked. Uh, Tara Lee Rodas, who we uh, spoke to here recently, she was a whistleblower for uh, at the Office of Refugee Relocation (ORR). Um, I sat in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and they're they're dropping people off um, to the same. You know what they do is they bring kids across the border. They have uh, documents that says they're going to this address, let's say in Florida, and that that address gets on some sort of a watch list, but they keep sending kids to that address. Nobody is investigating this address, who's there, how, what the relationship between the child and this person that they're driving the, the, kid, the kid to. And uh, there are hearings that some of these folks are supposed to go to, sponsorship hearings, they don't show up. So nobody is is tying up the loose ends on these problems. So there's that on that end of the spectrum. Where are these kids going? Yeah, it's it's just, there's so many 
problems <laughs> of, of where to, where to start to tackle this. Like you, you certainly aren't without your options um, to choose from here. It's a, it's a very dark industry um, for people to even wrap their heads around. I mean, if I were to look outside my window and look into my neighborhood, I would think, oh, it's not happening here. But the reality is, you know, I currently am in Denver and I know that Denver is one of the biggest hubs for it. Indeed. And it's happening in the neighborhoods that people would even least expect it to. Well, last year I sat in on a, um, it was University of Houston and uh, Sam Houston University hosted an event, an uh, anti-trafficking event that people came from all over the, uh, of the United States. It was the first time. This year we had the second annual. And they put up a study, Homeland Security put up a study in San Diego. I don't remember the time frame, but they were tracking that there were 84 kids in high school that they would go to school, get picked up after school, go work for somebody in the trafficking space, come home, have dinner with their, their family, do their homework and get up and repeat. And I sat there and I listened to this really incredible study. But then at the end, I was like, well, what did they do about it? Nothing. They just did a study. 84 children in one high school? Not in one school district. One school still. Yeah. Oh my yeah, gosh. A, yeah. And so, so that parents means, may may not even know that their child's involved in because they're sleeping under their roof. They're oh wow, I wasn't aware of that. That is a whole nother layer to it. Yeah. And of course, familial trafficking is very huge. There's a, a, a trafficking by people that you know, it's much more prevalent. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you've got an uncle that um uh, that could be mentoring a child and uh, he could be making money off of that child and unwittingly to the parents. They may be witting to it, but uh, maybe the uncle has a, a sister or a brother that is in a down and out and they're subsidizing money so they can live. You know, maybe they're a drug addict. There's all these different variations that I don't think I don't think some of these folks woke up and said, I'm going to start trafficking kids. Mm -hmm. They just, it, their morality erodes to the point where they justify their actions for, for need. It could be a drug habit. It could be their alcohol habit. It could be whatever habit that they have. And then they have a need because when you become some sort of an addict, it's hard to hold a regular job. It's hard to be in the business community, but it, you, if you could think about it, it's probably happening. Okay. So we know how big and how dark and how prevalent this uh, problem is. There is a solution though. There is a solution. And uh, you are one person who is part of that solution. And I am excited to be part of the solution, whatever way I can help out. And I hope that people in the audience are getting excited about how they might be able to help out. Before we kind of even get into that, let's talk about the solution and what's kind of happening. Um, because when you, the operations that need to occur to rescue these children, it's costly. It's, I mean, you have to, like, what are some of the, things that maybe some people wouldn't be aware of that goes into such an operation that costs like that would drive up the costs. So the way we do our operations, um, it's pretty interesting. When I came in, uh, basically we would have, we work at, we work with what we would call spec ops, tier one spec ops guys. These are special operations operators meaning Navy SEALs, Delta Force, that level. Craig, our founder, was a SEAL Team 6 sniper. And not a lot of people, they may or may not know that. But he has, he's a warfighter. He's been in combat. And a lot of the people, all the people that we work with have been in combat. And this is very important to understand. We're not Rambo. Our team is not Rambo. They're not there to kick in doors. They are what I call risk management. Okay. They make sure that law enforcement, because we work with law enforcement, keep in mind, less than 3% of law enforcement fired their weapons on duty. Okay. Whereas all these operators, they have fired their weapons on duty. And this is important. So we, we 
we provide them with support and make sure that they're safe. We have various operational templates that we op that we bring to. So when I bring a team out, I'm, what I'm paying for is I'm paying for airfare. I'm paying for rental cars. I'm paying for lodging. Me, uh, used to be we'd stay in hotels, but now we all get an Airbnb. It's more cost effective. We don't eat out a lot. Um, I cook. Mm -hmm. um, Kim cooks. We have various people. We eat healthy, you know, no liquor or anything mm -hmm. like that. We try to eat healthy, drink a lot of water, even do some meditation. You know, we, we even we pray together. Uh, we ground it. We, we saw, we say ground together. Kim, one day I was watching her walk out and it was 30 degrees outside. She's barefoot walking. I'm like, what are you doing? She goes, I'm grounding. So now we're all doing that. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a good way to, it's a good, healthy thing to do. I'm sure. And I can't wait to have Kim on the show. Oh yeah. Kim's awesome. Yeah. And, and jokingly, Nicole, you'll get this once you get to know her. I joke and tell Craig all the time. It's like, we're working for her. <laughs> <laughs> She's the smartest one amongst us all. She is, she is wonderful. But you know, I try to spend the money is like it's my own, okay. And I'm I'm very cost um, uh, I'm very cost conscious. Used to be we would pay for film crews. I don't I don't really um, I do have one. I do have a every now and then I'll have somebody on that I'm paying for. But I run a camera. We've got another team member that uh, runs a camera. Uh, we get donations from dr drone operators. We have a drone operator again. I'm just paying for lodging, food. And that sort of thing. And um, I, what I even do is, is oftentimes what I'll do is I meet people that are in, embedded in their community. Okay. And so what we'll do is I'll say, hey, why don't you connect me to Craig and I to the police chief, the sheriffs, um, and the district attorney. And what we'll do is we'll have a, comp a Zoom call. We will talk to them about what we can do, what we would need. We convince them to let us come teach them. And then what happens is I can fund that with the monies that we receive from our donors. But oftentimes I'll ask them, is, who is the, the car dealer or the furniture store, the person in your community that well, you would be considered um, the wealthiest, you know, in the smaller communities? And uh, oftentimes they'll say, it's this person. So I'll go to them and say, look, we're going to run an operation. I, I can fund it. I'll be happy to. But you know how, you know, instead of me asking you, hey, write me a big fat check. Why don't we run an operation when we're done? I'll hand you the receipts and you can pay us back. And that way, you know that where your money goes. Mm -hmm. So there are different things that we're doing to make sure that people are satisfied. Yeah. You know, you're running a nonprofit takes a lot of money. And there are mm -hmm. a lot of things that we we have. We have to be registered in all 50 states. We have to be audited. You know, there's a lot of things that we have to do. There's a lot of admin work that has to be done. Um, and so there are things, there are tools that we have to have in order to do that. So their, yeah. their money goes to those things as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then on top of the rescue mission, um, to actually get these children out, then, I mean, it doesn't stop there because you, what do you do with the children? Like you can't just like, where do they go? So what's, what's, I mean, there's money that is required for the aftercare to make sure that they're taken care of. Well, that's that's really a good point. And there's a shortage in aftercare. And uh, Kim, our so Kim Kelly, who's our social media director, and she's in the process. She is currently, um, and I can't give away their location. Uh, I don't know how if she's even shared what state it's in. So I, I won't do that at this point. But they're building a facility right mm -hmm. now. Somebody she's working with Philip Drake. Philip Drake uh, was a operator, a government operator for a long time. He did a lot of work down on the border. He's now running for president. Um, he is putting his money where his mouth is. He put, he got somebody to donate some land. They're putting money into it. They're building, we joke, they're building tiny houses. They're trying to build as many tiny houses with enough beds. They're, they have um, a strategy uh, that, or, 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 a methodology that they're utilizing to ensure that they're having the right counselors that, you know, for example, they don't, they won't ever have a child alone with another, with a, with an adult. Always, there will always be two adults in the proximity of the child. They want to make sure that that child is properly handled and that mm -hmm. there's nobody that would make any accusations. So Kim, um, when you speak to her, I'll let her tell you her story. She, she is um, truly amazing, but they're building this, uh, this place now. There is a huge shortage. And I'm hoping that 
that we'll be able to help um, anybody that is building a facility that they do it right. Uh, yeah. Vanessa Conan, we work with out of Rancho Milagro in Arizona. She actually has a equine therapy and she's wanting to add beds to her facility. And so we're promoting her as well. Um, are you, are you guys thinking of adding, um, animals to the aftercare, uh, program? Because I know that children, when they're coming out of such a horrific, um, situation that they don't trust anyone, but the first thing, like the first things that they'll trust are actual animals and it helps to reintegrate them. Is that something that you guys are, um, considering or that, you know, is, is actually part of other pro aftercare programs that already exist? Yes. The, the simple answer is yes. Rancho Milagro, they do equine therapy mm -hmm. um, and Kim's facility. She's going to have goats and chickens and, you know, horses probably. I mean, I know, I know she mentioned goats and chickens in, 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 um, in our conversation. So absolutely. And there's a real, there's a real purpose, you know, one thing that we all have to have, and I think this, this is emblematic of some problems that we're witnessing. We all need a purpose. Okay. And that purpose isn't a lifelong purpose. You know, when you get out of school, your purpose is to figure out what you're gonna do with your life, get a career. When you get married, your purpose is to be a, a good spouse and raise your kids and, and be a good provider. You know, I'm at this point in my life, you know, my kids are, my youngest are in college. I've been married 30, coming up on 32 years. But, so my purpose is doing what I'm doing here. I truly believe this is my purpose. And, but I think if you have a purpose in your community, it should be community driven. We have things that we need to do, but we should have also have a, a community purpose because if I'm taking care of, like when you have animals that a survivor is dealing with, what they learn is loving on that animal because here you have this animal that loves you unconditionally, may have just met you for the first time. I mean, if you've gone to a friend's house and that dog's licking your face and jumping all over you and that tail is just breaking all the furniture, that's, an, that's a level of love that we all need especially those that have been abused. We need that love. And so I think what happens is it helps us rewire our brains. We need our brains to be wired for positivity and have empathy and love and positive things. Every morning I wake up, I try to think about, you know, what I should be grateful for, not what I don't have. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got plenty to complain about. Okay. We all do. I mean, but if there's I, any way you, you are exposed to the worst of the worst. And so it all, it, it almost has to be a necessity for you to go through that in, the, in our daily ritual. It is. And what's funny is, um, you know, some of the, the team members, uh, you know, for me, I, I like to run and this is where I talk to my creator while I'm running and, out of the blue. I mean, I, I'll feel just normal. I'll get up in normal morning. I'll get my gear on. I'll start running in the woods. It'll be a week after an operation. I think all is good. And I'll get halfway in the woods and I'll just trip and fall down. And I'll just, I'll just start breaking, weeping. It's like, where did this come from? It's because I've absorbed that, all that energy. I've seen all this stuff and you can't unsee. I'm very well equipped for that, but I don't, I want you to understand that this isn't, I'm not unique to this. I'm talking to war fighters that, um, such as Craig, they do the same thing and this is how we process it. But we find that being grateful for what you have and your blessings in your life and the relationships that you have is very important because it helps you understand what your purpose is. And we, and again, I go back to, we all need a purpose. If you don't have a purpose, then what are you doing? You're wondrously aimlessly being emotionally driven on your decision-making. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, no matter how tough of a warrior you are, you're a human at the end of the day. And a child is the one thing that can really break down any sort of walls or compartmentalization that we may try to do to get on with our day or to do whatever it is we need to do. But at the end of the day, I think gratitude is one of the most important states of being to be in to override um and i wouldn't even say it's to override but to almost a transmute to to alchemize you know the the horror that you've had to face and, and understand that there is a purpose to all of this and there are good outcomes that are coming out of this you know for my audience you know it's i know so many of you 
are sometimes wondering, how can I help? What is my purpose? You know, there's so many different layers here that I could say to you, you may want to get involved in, but one of the easiest ways, well, first, the most important way for you to get involved is one, share this episode with as many people as you can, because we, you know, information is truly king in this world. Uh, people, if they don't know, they don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And we have to bring this to the attention of others. And of course, please do it in a way that is not pushing it on someone, <laughs> you know, really help them understand like that there's something that really could, uh, there are people that could really benefit from them watching this. And then of course, to ensure that we're getting more children out of these horrific situations and into the right aftercare facilities, donating money to this cause, such as Veterans for Child Rescue, I think is important. And this is where I've really been excited to come in is because when I was approached by Josh and Vaughn and Michael at United to One, um, they're like, you have a platform, you have people that you can reach. And, uh, you know, what we need is we need, we want to create a bridge so that organizations like you don't have to spend all this money creating events and renting out space. And, and it's so costly to do that for you. And this actually bridges the gap and allows for so much more money to go to you guys and helping the children. Um, and so, uh, I'd like you guys to know that I'm going to be leaving a link in the description below this video, or if you're listening on the podcast, and it will be on the front of my website as well, uh, that at any time, if you'd like to donate, you can. Now, what's really cool is that we're using a platform called OG Pay. So we're not using any of those other platforms. I'm not going to name any names, but this platform has been, I, I want to say the uh, the CEO of this platform has been incredible as well behind this and, and really giving so much to this cause uh, to make sure that this is built properly, that is extremely secure. And so uh, the link will take you to an OG pay site, which they have an app and you can do it on, on desktop. It doesn't matter, but you get a direct payment straight that goes straight to you guys. Straight to you. Immediately. 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 And you have the option of, say you want to donate a dollar a day so that you're consistently getting money. Because I think that's the real big issues that people don't realize is that you guys need that consistent money coming in to facilitate. It's not like just one big donation here or one big donation. It's because you can't really go and rescue a child until you have a certain amount of money. Is that correct? That is correct. So having that consistent money coming in is, is ideal. So guys, even if it's just a dollar a day, okay, whatever it is, and you can set it up so that it comes out of your account. And what's so great is that people get the, the tax uh, rebate. Like, so you can actually get a uh, claim it on your taxes. Correct. Indeed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a so, great place to do that. Yes. Yeah, it's a great place to do that. So um, all of that gets instantly delivered to you. You have instant access to it. And so I'm just super excited about this opportunity for us to maybe make a much bigger impact. Not maybe, we will. We are going to make a much bigger impact here on this problem. And I will do everything that I can to assist you guys in um, helping more children, uh, not just be rescued, but also get them the aftercare so that they can be reintegrated into our society and start living a life worth living. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So I hope that all of you can find it in your hearts to at very least, um, share this video or share this podcast anywhere you can on your social media, with friends, through text chats, wh wherever you can, please share it. And also consider donating on a regular basis. Uh, and I think what's also really cool, I'm not sure if they have this completely set up yet, but uh, if they don't, it's coming. Um, but you'll get, uh, when you sign up with OG Pay, you get a debit card and you can use it so that it takes money out of your account, um, just like any other debit card, but you can have it set up so that every time you purchase something, I, I don't know if it's like 1% or whatever, you can, you can actually choose the amount that it will round up. It'll round up to the, the dollar. That's what it is. So if you buy something and it's say 25, 27, okay, cents, then um, 73 cents are, are going to go to instantly, it's going to round up to $26 and 73 cents instantly goes to this cause. And so 
I love that. I think that's a beautiful way of just, and you know, it's, it's, you know, you don't have to think about it. It's, it's every time you purchase, you know, you're doing something good. Every time you spend your money, you're doing something great. And so that's also available. And I love that. And so, you know, Forrest, before we head off, is there anything that you would like to say to the people that you think is an important message that maybe we haven't covered yet that they need to hear? Yes, I would encourage your listeners to go watch Contraland at contralandmovie.com. That's C-O-N-T-R-A-L-A-N-D. This is a documentary and it shows the audience what we're doing. Okay. It's a live act. It's 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 um kind of um we run stings we with law enforcement, we bring in and do the arrests. We have a hundred percent conviction rate. Um Craig was at one point was a federal investigator. He's a federal air marshal. So we know how to stay within the law. And this is important people for people to understand is we have to follow the rules of, of the law to make sure that we have 100% conviction rate because we don't want these guys getting out. So watch Contraland. At the very least, just go watch the trailer. You can watch it for free on YouTube. Check out our trailer and it will wet your whistle and you say, well, I have to watch it now. Yeah. And uh, we all... You know, check out our website. There's a lot of things that you can do on, on our website. There's a lot of educational material. Um, there's uh, there, there's um, information on writing your Congress persons as well. I mean, we have so much information educational on there that Kim's put together. Um, but I would say go to you go to v4cr.org. That's v4cr.org. I'm Amazing. really horrible. <laughs> <laughs> hand signals. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll leave those links for everyone in the show notes. So it's easy for you to find. And also I want to say that just two days after this episode airs, I'll be on a TikTok live with Kim on your TikTok uh, channel to kind of talk about this even further. So I'm really excited to be part of that. So if you guys are on TikTok, uh, we'll be going live at, I believe it's uh, 8 p.m. Right, Eastern, 7 p.m. Central. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thursdays. Typically we do it on Thursdays. Yeah. 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 So um, check that out as well. I'll leave their TikTok uh, link in the description as well. So this has been really great for us. I'm so glad that we've been able to connect and share this information with the audience and to know that there are, there are good things starting to happen in this world. There's, there, there's solutions that are being found. And could you just, even before we go, I think this is important too. Could you let them, my audience know of the difference that this is beginning to make so that they know that their change is happening? The average predator um, has a body count of 70 in their lifetime. It's not the number of incidents, it's 70. So if we get them early, then we would stop hundreds of in instances and you know up to 70 potential victims. So you start multiplying that it, it, that number gets to be astronomical. And that's what we're wanting to do. We want to move up the food chain, wreck their logistics, banking, you name it. That's where we're heading. We want to wreck this system and get rid of it out of our society. Yeah. And how successful have you guys been with, how many children have you been able to uh, rescue, save? We, we traditionally are going more after the predators and okay. the, we've, we've, we've rescued a handful directly. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you that recently we're seeing an uptick in um, people coming to, to kidnap kids and we've intercepted them probably three different times in the last year. And so okay. these are, these are teams that who knows how many, I mean, they're, they're, they're like fishing. They're on a daily basis. They've got to be fishing, um, because they're really good at it. And so, um, like I said, we're trying to go move, go after the, the criminal root. element. Yeah. 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 You gotta go. Yeah. You gotta go where the problem is starting. So that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for us for coming on the show. And thank you to the audience for being here today, for sticking around and listening all the way through. I love you guys so much. And I appreciate your support. And you know how important this cause is to me. I have really, um, oh, the, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart that the people that are behind this have very pure hearts and their intentions are in alignment with God. They're in alignment with all that is good in this world. And so if you have any apprehensions, you know, all I can give you is my word and what I know, but uh, I can tell you that there, these are good people that are doing this work. And I encourage you to be one of those good people supporting their work. I love you guys. And I will see you next week. 
Thanks again for joining me for another show on the Enlighten Up podcast. I love you guys so much for all of your continued support. So remember to raise your vibe, find your tribe and be open to the infinite possibilities held in the mysteries that surround us all. Thanks again for sharing the show with your family and friends. And if you're new to the show and you need to find out more information about me, please head on over to my website, NicoleFrolic.com, where you can join my newsletter. And please follow me on Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube. Keep your light bright and I'll see you next week.